leadership, uh, followership, and then also context. And I understand your new book is about context. It is. Can you tell me a little bit about, can you give me an insight of what it's Okay, I'll give you a little bit of history, and okay. then, then you can ask follow-up questions. Thank so you. the history is that I was a leadership person like all the other leadership persons, and then I wrote a book called Bad Leadership. When I wrote the book called Bad Leadership, I realized there was no such thing as bad leadership without bad followership. And I thought, oh, that's odd. Why isn't anybody writing about followership? By the way, when I wrote Bad Leadership, I also realized you can't really get it unless you put it in a context, if, you, if it just sort of suspended out there. In any case, in response to my sort of visceral, intellectually I understood it, but finally viscerally, understanding the, the um, inseparable relationship between leaders and followers, I really became persuaded it was pretty idiotic to study leaders without followers. So I wrote the book, Followership, uh, in response to that recognition, which grew out of my writing, Bad Leadership. Then I wrote a book, uh, there was a few other books in between, but then I wrote a book called The End of Leadership in which I really took on not just how leadership and followership, particularly leadership, have changed in the 21st century, even in recent years, from what it was 10, 15 years ago. Uh, but I also took on my own profession to some degree, what I call the leadership industry, which is a multi-billion dollar industry. It's a huge business. Uh, mainly teaching, of course, people how to lead, or th we think we teach people how to lead. We don't really have much measurement of it. Um, and I s did a lot of blogging at around the same time. That then got me increasingly interested in context. So, of course, everybody talks about the United States of America having a leadership crisis, and gee, how come leaders aren't as good as they used to be, and what's wrong with the American people, what's wrong with Congress, what's wrong with the corporate sector. And I became, as I wrote, and even through my blog, I have a regular blog most of the time, I haven't done it in the last month because I was finishing the book, uh, increasingly aware of how the setting matters, not just the immediate setting, the immediate group or organization, but the larger setting as well. So I now talk really only, it's not that I don't talk about leaders, don't talk about followers, don't talk about context, but mainly I talk about what I call the leadership system. It is a system with three parts. Each of them affects the other two. Part one is the leader, part two is are the followers, part three is the context. And I am increasingly persuaded that to look at one of those three parts without looking simultaneously and coming to understand and cope with uh, the other two makes neither practical sense nor theoretical or intellectual sense. Uh, in fact, Americans, I, I, I'll bring it to the United States, although I'm happy to talk about China or Russia or Germany or any place mm -hmm. else, but if you're talking about the United States, in fact, uh, ordinary people, if we're talking about political leadership, uh, <coughs> they are badly informed. Americans do very badly on uh, sort of quizzes on, you know, who's the vice president, what, who's your member of Congress. We, don't, we do absolutely worse than people in other countries. We also don't vote anymore. The voting, other than in presidential elections, the numbers are appallingly low. So yes, we are bad followers. Again, if we're talking about the political context, absolutely we're bad. We don't even do minimally sort of responsible civic engagement, such as voting. And about leaders, look at, of course, it depends on which leaders you're talking about. Uh, one of the reasons I wrote Bad Leadership is because everybody understands that as much good leadership as there is, there is also, you know, everywhere around us bad leadership in its different forms. There are different forms of bad leadership. And in the book, Bad Leadership, I talk about it, but so you can have very evil leadership. And you can have ineffectual leadership, corrupt leadership, and we're mesmerized, by the way, as you and I are sitting here and talking on the 24th of January, 2014. Uh, the country is mesmerized by the case of Governor Chris Christie of uh, New Jersey and the case of uh, Governor Bob McDonald, um, a former governor now, in, uh, from the state of Virginia. Uh, so there's plenty of bad leadership to go around. Speaking of um, your book on bad leadership, one of the, you have once said that Bad leadership is a social disease which needs to be attacked. W would it be fair to argue that perhaps there's been too many attacks on bad leadership 
if you look at the press, if you look at social media, it seems like we're very good at attacking. Perhaps that has contributed to the lack of interest. Yeah, I think we're using the word attack in a different way. Yeah. I agree with what you're saying. That's not very helpful, screaming, yelling. Uh, when I say attack, I mean attack the way you would a disease. So the analogy I always make is we put a lot of money as a country, I'll again confine it to the United States, uh, we put a lot of money into heart disease and AIDS and cancer and so forth. We do not invest anything, including the leadership industry. We invest nothing in understanding bad leadership, in trying to figure out how to attack it, not as screaming and yelling, but how to cope with it, how to address it. So if an organization has a bad leader, as is very well known, those bad leaders are typically very difficult to unseat. So um, to the extreme example today is in Syria, where everybody knows that the leader is horrible, evil indeed, and yet the world watches unable to figure out, in fact, how to get rid of this man. And you have this in companies, you have it in the workplace, you have it in school systems, you have it in the military, where people are gossiping about how bad the leader is, but nobody is able to attack it in the sense of trying to figure out how to change it. That's what I mean when I say attack. So speaking of, uh, speaking of the Middle East, uh, you've written about technology's influence on the change of regimes in, in Tunisia, for instance, and we saw it with Twitter in, uh, in Egypt, at least act, acting as a catalyst. Um, how do you see technology changing the way we, our political and corporate system operates? You know, I think the leadership industry has done a very poor job so far of trying to figure out the answers to your questions. Now, what I will say is that any answer I give you in 2014 is likely to be very different in 2019, just the way the answer in 2014 is very different from what it would have been five years ago. The lightning speed with which technology now is changing our lives giving people a voice that they never had before, at the same time giving the powers that be a, a an array of uh, capacities that they never had before. In other words, you know, through Edward Snowden, Americans are finding out now how technology has invaded their lives in ways that they did not know. In general, I think it has a leavening effect between leaders and followers. In general, I think it gives followers a voice they never had before, makes it very hard for leaders to exercise power, authority, or influence the way they did in the past. But as I said, I think, um, number one, the, the field has really not looked at this closely so far. Not that many people are talking about it. A few of us are. Uh, one of my colleagues here is uh, in international relations. Um, uh, at, but it, it is, it is uh, peculiar, uh, the alacrity with which uh, human beings are having to cope with this. One final word about technology. One of the ways it is making lives le the lives of leaders difficult is that most leaders are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Most of them were born after the digital revolution began, and they're simply not adroit enough at the technologies to understand them, so their own chief information officers are having a kind of clout over them that they never had before. They're having, in most cases, to delegate the management of technology because they themselves, leaders themselves, corporate, public sector, again, military, educational across the board, they simply don't understand the technologies well enough. Well, that's a you know, I'm not going to give you some simple, well, we just all join hands and it's going to, you know, the world's going to be a better place. In fact, I, you know, the impulse is to say that this democratization, which is in a way what it is when you have more people speaking out. Uh, and by the way, this is mirrored also on the international scene. So the United States, which used to be uh, without question, you know, kind of it was after the Soviet Union collapsed, it was the United States was the most dominant country in the world. It sort of still is, but you now have a kind of multipolar world in which even smaller countries have a voice that they didn't have before. So what you see at the national level is also mirrored at the international level. Um, you know, I, I think one of the problems with technology is, is it changes faster than the human brain can adapt to it. We're not really, the human brain is not equipped particularly well to cope with change that's that fast. And I think we have yet to figure out 
we have yet to figure out how we're going to govern ourselves. You see it again in Europe, you see it in Asia, you see it in Africa, you see it in Latin America. How do we govern ourselves in a reasonably democratic way if, in fact, uh, people are so demanding, so insistent, so I want, I want, I want. So you're originally from Europe. I don't have to tell you about European politics. Germany is this, probably the single exception. In general, it's been driven by followers, a li rather like here, who say to their government, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this, and by the way, I don't want to pay the taxes. <laughs> so we have a kind of dysfunctional uh, system in which even well-intentioned democratic kinds of leaders have a hard time governing because followers are so demanding and their people are worried that if they do something such as higher taxes, uh, people will simply vote them out of office. It's a terrific dilemma. I mean, I'm thinking of Hollande of France, who uh, is of course at an abysmally low poll approval numbers now, but even when he took over from Sarkozy, he began at an incredible disadvantage. And the riots in Greece and in Spain and in Portugal and Ireland, people took to the streets. In England, they took to the streets. Uh, so it's tough. Good governance is tough. And uh, I think the human race is going to have to figure out new, assuming we don't want to be repressed, because that's what you have in some countries like China, where the, the authorities were getting so nervous about people blogging and people uh, pr uh, protesting in various ways, often using technology, that they have become increasingly repressive, the authorities in China, in recent weeks and months even. So I think that, that we are still trying to figure out with no snap replies to your complicated question. Hmm. Interesting about France is that both um, political leaders you described became more popular among the followers when it was discovered that they had mistresses. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about um, followers and kind of some cultural differences that you see across the world oh, yeah, and commonalities? Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons this most recent book of mine, which is called Hard Times, Leadership in America, coming out in about a half a year, uh, is because of just what you're talking about. I think, you know, in the field of leadership, you often have to have hold in your hand or in your head two conflicting ideas at the same time. So I'm going to give you an example. One is exactly what you say. There are profound cultural differences. Americans are not like Germans. Germans are not like Brazilians. Brazilians are not like Japanese. There are profound cultural differences. Just to speak in terms of nations, of course, there are religious differences and gender differences and racial differences. Lots of differences. At the same time, all of us who are living in the world at this moment in time, with the exception maybe of a few uh, um, outliers like North Korea, uh, we are experiencing some of the same things, such as, to go back to something you raised a few moments ago, uh, technology and changes in the culture. So uh, leadership is an example where you have simultaneously some universals, things that since time immemorial are the same. It's why we still read Plato and we still read uh, Machiavelli, because the prince holds now the way it did hundreds of years ago. At the same time, there are also profound differences. And anybody who studies leadership has to understand that these two things coexist simultaneously. Speaking of studying leadership, why should anybody <laughs> in the world <laughs> study leadership? Well, uh, first of all, the field is, to, to put it very crassly, divided into two categories. One is leadership training, development, all that. In other words, the how-to. People take leadership courses, for example, at the Kennedy School, the Business School, executive ed programs. They are taking those courses because they think that if I take this course, I, can, I too can become a leader, or I can be a better leader than I am. So there's the whole how-to field, leadership development, leadership training. And then there's the other field, which I think is maybe a little bit more where you are, which is leadership studies, the more cognitive or intellectual or academic aspect of it. I always consider myself in that. I tell my students, if I don't know how to teach you how to lead, I do know how to teach you something about leadership, leadership and followership. Um, so I have remained uh, in it all my, uh, interested in it all my professional life. I'm as engaged by it now intellectually as I ever was decades ago. Uh, 
Uh, but when you ask about should an academic, I think it's risky because there are not that many good jobs, you know, getting a PhD in leadership, getting any PhD. I think one has to be very careful now because it's tough to find a job. It's certainly tough to find a, a decent job as opposed to sort of an adjunct job. So I would be careful, but if from a purely uh, work point of view, but from an intellectual point of view in terms of being engaged, uh, I find it endlessly interesting. But again, I'm in, I have a sort of, my part of the field is the, um, the intellectual journey. It's not the how-to part. Somebody at the Kennedy School by the name of Marshall Gaines, I'm sure you know his name, uh, that's what he does. He says it's, you know, one way of getting into it. Look, I think, uh, especially in this day and age, a person's story, uh, we sort of expect to know at least parts of it, at least in political life, maybe much less in the uh, private sector and in other sectors. So I think it it's always a good idea to have a, it's a good idea to have a narrative when you and I came together. You sent me your Vita because you wanted me to know a little bit about you, who you are. You probably looked up a little bit about me before you ever walked in here. A lot. So I think, okay. so I think narrative, which is simply, what is narrative? It's a way of bringing in the other. It is a way of making a connection. So it's not something I particularly do or focus on, but it makes sense in everyday life, so why not in leadership? Dr. Cummins, thank you so much.